And the Lord sent so to the land of Amalek and said, Go and utterly destroy man and woman, male and female, all the beasts, even the infants, and everything. Go and smite them. Utterly destroy all that they have and spare not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. But when so went on that assignment, so went and did his own. Verse 9 says, But so and the people speared Agag. This is contrary to God's instruction. God said, go and destroy all. And he gave Saul an opportunity to go and do that. But verse 9 says, Saul was a disappointment. He was not a man. He speared King Agag. He speared the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and dreadful. That it destroyed utterly. So Saul did something as if he went to represent God. But then the Bible says he only got there to do what he wanted. Sometimes when people are looking for elections, they promise the electorates heaven and earth. We will build you a bridge. We will improve your Nepa. We will do you good roads. We will give you free education. We will make food abundance. Nobody will sleep in touch house anymore. We will do everything. And then we go and cast our votes for them. Thinking is a man. But just after he has won the election, he doesn't even know the road to his village anymore. You go and sit far, 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 far. You are not even hearing about him again. God sent Saul, thinking that Saul was a man. But when Saul got on duty, Saul only proved that he was an ordinary human being. He went there to do his own thing. So the Lord was going to do replacement. After God gave him a long rope and he wouldn't change, God was going to do replacement. In chapter 13 verse 14, But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. Because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. This was God's conclusion about Saul. He said to Saul, I thought you were a man. That if I put you on duty, if I make you a principal of that school, if I make you a provost of that college, if I make you a rector of that polytechnic, if I make you a vice chancellor of that university, if I make you a traditional ruler in that domain, I was thinking you will bring my purpose to bear on the land. You will stand for me. You will bring righteousness. You will cause righteousness to reign. But I'm surprised. You took this opportunity to do your own. I thought when I make you a police. 
police officer DPO you will cause righteousness to reign in the police station where you are I thought when I post you on the highway as a mobile policeman or anything those are the checkpoints I thought righteousness will reign but when you got there it was disappointment you did your own so the Lord decided and said I will replace you I just pray that instead of giving God chance to replace you you will rather change in the name of Jesus In this meeting, we will have opportunities for opportunities to change. When God was appointing Saul, he was not doing so that he can repair, I mean, change him tomorrow. But when Saul proved a useless human being, the Lord had no option but to change him. Some of our principles some schools are called magic centers why are they called magic centers because candidates pass out with 20 I mean credits can you imagine that somebody has 9 credits including English and mathematics and when you say come he's going What kind of credit is that? Sometimes we get a youth copper and you are asking him, write this thing. He doesn't know the spelling. And yet, as we visit these schools, the leaders, they take their position and use the opportunity to oppress students. There's a hand, hand, uh, handout. Just one sheet of paper, 5,000. If you don't buy it, no matter how brilliant you are, you are not going to graduate. That is oppression. You meet some lecturers. Whom God gave opportunity to resent him. They are oppressing female students. They are saying, if I don't sleep with you, you will not graduate. This is the kind of life that Saul was living. Yes, God put Saul on duty and sent him to go and accomplish assignment for him. But when Saul went, he began to do his own. And the Lord said, because you have continued this way, I am going to replace you. In verse 14, God said, actually, I have already sought, I have gone around, I have checked, and I have found a man after my own heart. Chapter 14 verse 28 says, I have found a neighbor of yours that is better than you. Excuse me. If we are looking for a better Nigeria, we cannot take another wrong person to replace with another wrong person. We must get somebody that is better than the former. That is what can transform our country. sent Saul and Saul only went there to do his own thing God cannot bring another person who will also go there to do his own thing he must bring someone that will represent him that will stand for him and God will not be ashamed to identify with that person so when the Lord said 
David is a man after my own heart. Now we are beginning to come to the point of, so what is man in the heart of God? In the heart of God, a man is not just a human being. A man is a man that is better than soul. A man is that someone that his interest, his desire, his commitment is to bring the presence of God to bear on the land. A man in the heart of God is that human being that when he sees that things are going contrary to the will of God, he will not keep quiet. He will not close his eyes. He will speak out. I found a man. And who was that man? It was David. David at the age of 17 years. He was already standing for God. At the age of 17 years. David could oppose Goliath. Who was a terror. To the people of Israel. At the age of 17. David will not watch evil pass by. At the age of 17. It was impossible. For Goliath. To exercise wickedness. Over the children of Israel. David stood up to oppose him. You remember that Saul fought Goliath for 40 days. He couldn't defeat him. But when David came, it was with one stone that he finished Goliath. And there was peace in the land. Our fathers, our brothers, our friends, Look at the opportunity God has given you. Not just 40 days. Some of you have been in the leadership position for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years. And we see Goliath just enjoying even though you are on duty. God is looking for a man that will stop the enemy from parading as the boss. In the heart of God, a man is not just a human being. No? And a man is not just a male factor. There are some males. But who are females in their hearts? Look at this testimony. God is saying, David is a man after my own heart. That is, I am happy with David. Excuse me, is God happy with you? As a principal of a college, is God happy with you? As a traditional ruler, and you preside over land cases, is God happy with you? As a police officer, is the Lord happy with you? Dear VC, is the Lord happy with you the way you are running that university? Can God identify with you and he will not be ashamed? Some of us are young people, students. You are a man in the making. On your campus, is God happy with you? Are you not behind the several riots in the school? 
Are you not encouraging the activities of cultism? The Lord said, David is a man after my own heart. So anytime there was wickedness anywhere and oppression and God wanted to stop it, he will send David. Again, why was David a man after God's own heart? When David fell, he was quick to repent. David was, a not, was not a man that will hide his own weakness. When David slept with Uriah's wife and Nathan visited him, and Nathan spoke, David said, I am the one. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm the one. I'm the one. Have mercy on me. This is what God needs. If for any reason you fall, it is not hiding of your sin that is the answer. If you can own it up and ask the Lord, so please forgive me and plan never to fall again, you will be a man after God's own heart. Again, we noticed that for David, because he was a man after God's own heart, even the tears, the weeping of David was a weapon. When the enemies came and carried David's wife and all his soldier men's wives and children and they were going and David was in another battle as he returned he just saw that ah everything is finished the enemy has done his worst the bible said David and his men they wept until they had no strength and you know God heard that, that cry A man after God's own heart, even his weeping is a weapon. When he cried and finished, he asked God a question. Lord, if I pursue these people, will I, will I make it? The Lord said, yes. You are my man. I will go with you. Pursue and you will overtake and recover all and there will be no loss. That's how David got up. He had 600 soldiers. As they began to go, 200 became too weak. They fell on the way. He just went with 400. Look, a man after God's own heart, even if he's alone, he's in the majority. Maybe in your office, you are like Micaiah, one man facing a host of evil people. Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. False prophet came to Micaiah and said, Look, everybody is saying the same thing you know, to make you Ahab happy. When you go, don't say different. Micaiah said, No! What the Lord says to me, that's what I will say. That's a man after God's own heart. Who among us will break tradition of evil in our land and change Nigeria for the better? When we are saying we need a change in Nigeria and you yourself, you are not changing, it's a wrong dream. It will never come to pass. Oh. That change must begin with me. If I'm doing something evil and I'm expecting Nigeria to be better, it's a lie. It won't work. You go to churches, pastor are saying, do as I say, but not as I do. What kind of gospel is that?
Do you know that if you bring a dog, a dog on this pulpit, and ask the dog to preach, the dog will still preach righteousness? Oh? Carry a pig, come and put here, and say, pig, preach. It will preach righteousness. But when you want that pig to practice righteousness, it cannot. So God found in David a man after his own heart. God said, David is better than Saul. So God was going to use David to replace Saul. Even in this meeting, God is looking for people that he can use to replace the wrong men in big positions in Nigeria. I pray that God will not look at you and be wishing that you are the one to be replaced. That God will find you a man after his own heart who will be well instructed to go and be a replacement somewhere. If we say we don't want exam or practice in Nigeria, then we are going to be looking for principles that God has worked over their lives and they can stand for him and oppose exam or practice. Let me ask you, was David not a human being? Was he an angel? Excuse me, was David an angel? Why was he different from Saul? David made up his mind that will not take part in the evils that are going on. David gave God the chance to transform him. God has brought you to this meeting. And I'm praying that you will also give him chance to transform you. When the Lord has succeeded with your life, when you return from where you came from, things will be better. Things will change. God will be honored. I saw God comparing these two people. Say, between David and Saul, I prefer David. And what was that thing that disqualified Saul? It was disobedience. Excuse me. Are you doing those things that God said you should not do? Then remember that is what disqualifies Saul. Some of you, once upon a time, the heart of God was on you. But when he gave you opportunities in life, you failed him. We didn't know you could embezzle money before until God gave you a higher position and you started doing it. Now let me tell you, as we are beginning to do that, you should be ready for disgrace. God is about bringing revival in Nigeria and all the sons of disobedience that we have to give way. You will just be hearing whether on radio this person is removed from office. This person is removed from office. This person is removed from office. And then this person has taken his position. This person has said, why? God is on a replacement program. But you see, before we can get to that kind of point, 
we give you opportunity. Rather than be replaced, you could repent. Rather than be kicked out of office in shame, you could say, Lord, I'm sorry about my own kind of life. And I want you to take over my life and help me. If you are thinking that God cannot do without you, it's a lie. Yo. When Saul was on the throne, he never knew that there was any David that could replace him. But once he began to misbehave, the Lord kicked him out and he put so. I said, I've got your neighbor. Not far away, your neighbor. But he's better than you. He will take your place. When he began to beg the prophet Samuel and he got hold of his dress, then the dress got torn. The Lord said, you have confirmed your wahala. As you have torn the dress of the prophet, that is how you have torn your own kingdom. I pray that the Lord will succeed with us this morning. That the Lord can also change his language about you. When he sees you like this, he should be able to say, you are a man after my own heart. We will pray now. And I want you to look deep inside of you. What disqualified soul was disobedience. He failed God. He didn't live up to what God expected him to do. He went on a godly assignment, but began to feed his own stomach. Say, he speared fat, fat, fat cows. All those animals that were good in his eyes, he speared them to come and slaughter in his house and to eat. And Agag, the king, because so knew that this kind of man, you can get something from him, he speared him. And Samuel came and said, is obedience not better than sacrifice? Why is it that I sent you on assignment and you didn't do it? You stood up to do your own. From today, you have turned your kingdom by your own hands and your own is finished. Before that kind of thing will come to us, I like us to be wise people, to be wise fathers, to be wise uncles, and say, Lord, don't replace me. Rather help me to change. Shall we pray together? Pray that the Lord will succeed with your life. The Lord will make a deep touch on your own life. Holy Spirit, change us. Don't allow us, oh God, to remain in our wrong situations. Let the Holy Spirit do a work of transformation in our lives. Pray that the Lord will create hatred for evil in your own heart. Oh, so disappointed God. Lord, we don't want to disappoint you in our own generation. Help us. Help us, oh God, not to fail you. Not to fail you. Not to abuse the privileges you have given us in life. As God will be coming into the hall today, and we're touching lives here, touching lives here, touching lives, pray that He will not bypass you, that the Lord will also touch you as a person. Oh God, touch my life, touch my life, transform me. Don't allow me to go the way of King Saul. Make me a David. Make me a man after your own heart. In 
In my own house, make me a David. In my office, make me a David. In my ministry, make me a David, Lord. Make me a David. Make me a man after your own heart. Even as a student on campus, make me a David. As a traditional ruler, Lord, make me a David. Change me, Lord. Make me a man after your own heart. May I not escape your finger? Let me not escape your finger. Touch me. Touch me, Lord. Make me a replacement. Make me a replacement. But not to be replaced. Make me a man at the gate. Make me a man at the gate, oh God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us to your high table this morning. You've taken time to show us two lives. And you preferred one to another. And the reasons are clear. David was an obedient child. David had the fear of God in his heart. David was the one that will stand in the gate of Israel and Goliath will not prevail. David was the one that could end a 40-day battle in one day. But Saul, he was a disobedient traditional ruler. He taught his people how to commit sin. Saul was someone consulting witches. Saul was not afraid to perform the duties of a priest when he was not. And Saul, even when he fell, there was no repentance. Even when Samuel visited him and showed him his sin, there was no repentance. But when Nathan visited David and showed him his sin, David repented. God, we are praying this morning and asking that your visitation this morning and this day into our lives will make meaning in the name of Jesus Christ. That you are coming in our midst will bring repentance. It will bring revival. It will bring change in the name of Jesus Christ. We will not waste your coming. Oh God, that we will not waste your coming. We will not waste your visitation. We will not waste your instructions. In the name of Jesus. Grant that your word will make us better than Saul. Grant that your word will make us men after your own heart. Oh Lord, we are asking 
that in our day you will not have a cause to say and I sought for a man I didn't find when we are here. Find us in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing us. For in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036359. 7681198 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Esther chapter 2 we will read together from verse 19 of chapter 2 we will stop at chapter 3 maybe at verse 6 of chapter 3 I want to read from the King James Version And when the virgins were gathered together in the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the thing was known to Mordecai who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when the inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out, therefore, they were both hung on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. Chapter 3. After these things, King Asarius promoted Haman, the son of Mahedatha, and the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had commanded concerning him, sorry, for the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressed thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spoke daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. 
And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Aserus, even the people of Mordecai. Praise the name of the Lord. As the Lord began yesterday, and I know this morning, to begin to look at the issues of men at the gate. The Lord began to bring to us yesterday the fact that God knows each and every one of us what we would be and what we would do. But I saw that the Lord wants for each and every one of us be that one which we by the position of his being a mere man being the man at the gate to have a very positive impact not just for his own generation but for generations even to come as we began to look at the life of, of um, Abraham yesterday. This morning I want us to look at the qualities of the gatekeeper the qualities of the gatekeeper and I will want to tell you why I'm persuaded that the Lord will want us to look very briefly using the life of Mordecai to begin to discover the qualities of the gatekeeper. Because as I heard the Lord say yesterday that I know him, I know him, that he is going to teach his own children, he's going to teach his own seed to fear me. I saw that the, man, the Lord is looking very deeply into our own lives as it were to discover that which is in so that he can commit himself to us because that we are men that should have very great effect and impact. As we look at the qualities of the gatekeeper, I just wanted us to note maybe first and First and foremost, that it is very much traditional to think of a get man than a get woman. We don't hear much about someone being a get man, a get woman, but it's a very common expression that a man is a get man, isn't it? I see this then as the reserve of the male man. So when we are talking of the gate man, when we are talking of God placing men as strategic places, those that will determine what we come in and go out, those that will determine what will happen in the house, in the city, the Lord is thinking very much of the man. And so as we sit together under the Lord, we are trusting the Lord that as he thresh us, as he speaks with us, 
we will also develop the qualities of the get man that God is looking at, looking for. And as I looked at the story of Mordecai, whom we are going to use very briefly this morning, as we pray the Lord to impact upon our lives the qualities of a gatekeeper, that when the Lord looks at us, he will say, I know you. I have seen deep inside. I've seen your content. I've seen what is in you. I know that you will do this for the future generation and for even the present generation. I want us to know that I'm persuaded to study this. I got excited to study it because as I looked at it, I saw that God is intending to turn the gates to us. That whoever we are, in whatever position we are, we may not be on the top, we may not be on the apex leadership, we may not be the people completely in charge. Because as I looked at the book of uh, Esther, especially at the beginning, before God brought Mordecai even to the very high point, even to what we may call a promotion, that he was now in charge. Even before that, I saw that the influence of Mordecai was so much that whatever happened in the nation, Mordecai was quietly the key to it. So I'm noting that God is speaking to us. Many of us that are here, we may not be in very high positions. We may not be in very apex leadership, as I am noting. But as I looked at Mordecai, because I saw that the notable people in the book of uh, Esther, they were the king, they were Esther herself, then Haman. But whatever happened in the kingdom, I'm noting that even the rise of Esther, the very life of the king, the fall of Haman, the deliverance of the people of the Jews, the notable things, events that took place in the book of Esther, they were all hinged on the quiet, quiet labors of Mordecai. And I, when I saw it, I got, I got excited that indeed God is intending to turn the gates to our locations. That that's the place we are. What, whatever position we are, we, the, we be the place of influence, the place that God very quietly, we manipulate things. We get a hold on whatever organization be our, our Lord. God will use that position very quietly to be a position of influence, a position that it may not be published. We may not be so noticed, but it will be what we are, where we are, that things will be quietly manipulated, will quietly uh, cause to happen. When I saw that, I felt that each and every one of us 
She will just cultivate very quietly these qualities of a gatekeeper as we are going to be looking at in, in the life of Mordecai. So as we read from verse, verse 19 of, of Esther, we began to see that there are two qualities that stand up very clearly from Esther chapter 2 verse 19 through to chapter 3 and verse 6 that we read. There may be many others, many other qualities of Mordecai as a gatekeeper that we may not be able to consider. But these two that we want to look at just immediately, I would want that the Lord will cause us to consider them and will help us to indeed be men that God can bless at the gate. I discovered that as we read chapter 2 verse 19, and when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate, and Esther had not yet showed herself, nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. And the rest of what is stated there. I saw one quality of Mordecai that I want us to quickly consider. The quality of selflessness. Mordecai portrayed and showed himself as a very selfless man. We will look at other verses also to highlight very briefly the selflessness of Mordecai. And I'm praying that God will help each and every one of us. The Lord may be speaking to us far beyond what we may immediately discover in Mordecai. But I saw that this quality of selflessness is one quality that God must call forth in each of our lives if we are going to be God's own gatekeeper as he's speaking to us. The first expression of selflessness that I saw in Mordecai is first and foremost the way she raised Esther to become the queen. The way she raised Esther to become the queen. I saw a very selfless service and a very selfless man. If we will read chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says, And he, that is Mordecai, brought up Hadassah, had Adasa, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took her, took for his own daughter. And we know that Esther was raised 
when she now came into the hands of Mordecai to eventually become the queen. But what made me to think about to admire Mordecai and to pray this morning as this came to my heart to share with us is that phrase that he took her for his own daughter. Mordecai took Esther for his own daughter. Before now, I used to think that perhaps Mordecai had no children. I used to think that Esther was the only relation, close relation of Mordecai that Mordecai had to bring up. I used to think that Esther was the only baby that Mordecai could adapt and to bring her up. But as I studied the life of Mordecai, as I was looking at Mordecai this morning, I discovered that Mordecai had his own children. Then it became more glaring. It became something very gracious to me to think that Mordecai took Esther as his own daughter and brought Esther up in such a way, in such a manner that Esther became the queen. Let me show you that I've discovered that Mordecai had his own children and that Mordecai, just like Abraham, was a man that God that God deeply also respected for God to raise Nehemiah, uh, Mordecai to the position of becoming the prime minister of this kingdom it is because of his selflessness and I believe the Lord that the Lord will raise us up from whatever positions we are as he has brought us to begin to speak to us about gatekeepers, the Lord indeed wants to put us in charge. But may the Lord help us to begin to look at the fact that it takes a man who is selfless for the Lord to place at the gate. Let me just before I read the scripture to show us that Mordecai had other children. Let me note that, sincerely speaking, the gate man is a selfless man. Most gate men, they only open for others to go in and to come out. They don't have a bicycle of their own. And if they even they have, when they come, nobody opens the gate for them. They stand there, day and night, and at the horn of every vehicle, the gate man is running, as it were, to open for whosoever he has checked and he can admit into the place of abode where he is taking charge. It takes a man who is selfless to be a get man. But I'm saying as he showed in Mordecai, in the raising up of Esther, Mordecai had other children. Look at chapter 3 of Esther, sorry, chapter 10 of Esther and verse 3. To let us discover that Mordecai had 
his children that the Bible is calling his seed. Verse 3 says, For, the, for Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Aserus, and great among the Jews. And he was accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. Do you discover that Mordecai had his own children? Praise the Lord. And do you see that he handled his children, his own seed, as Abraham handled his, that God made him a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper of the type of Abraham, as we discovered, was Mordecai. The Bible says, number one, Mordecai, he was next unto Aserus and was great among the Jews. Oh, and the Bible says, and all accepted, all accept, and all accepted of the multitude of his own brethren. How he was so loved. How when Mordecai was coming, everybody, everybody loved him, accepted him. When I, when I saw that the Bible says, of all his brethren, all the Jews, they accepted Mordecai because he was so selfless. But I was noting that Mordecai had his children. He spoke peace to all his seed. And if Mordecai had his children, and Mordecai then brought up Esther, the way he brought her up, it became a theme of great A very great impartation, very great example in my own heart. I just want you to think of the average Christian home. And all of us that are here, most of us are fathers. I want you to just imagine within yourself and especially if you happen to have house helps or relatives and that are not your children they are not from your alliance as it were perhaps they are your cousins perhaps they are your your nephews perhaps they are just distant cousins that you are brought to your own home to help you. Do you know that for Mordecai, he didn't just bring Esther to help him. Number one, Esther was very, very, very helpless. All her parents have died. And whatever Mordecai would do to Esther, I don't think Esther had anywhere else to go. Esther seemed to have been trapped in Mordecai's house, in Mordecai's hands. If not for the life of Mordecai that was so gracious, and the vision of Mordecai that was before him for the Jews, if not for the life of Mordecai that God has thoroughly touched, that Mordecai would accept Esther not as a dependent, not as a, a, a distant relation, the Bible says, and he took Esther for his own daughter. I want you to see the kind of thing that happens to children who are not our children in our various homes. Even those of us that are very, 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 very 
very, we, that, that we are very high in churches. We are good people, so to say. Let me ask you. Do your dependent go to the same school as your children? Does that girl or that boy feel the same way that your blood children, your blood daughter and sons feel and exercise liberty in your own home? I saw that for Mordecai, Esther was a daughter. He was not just a son of, uh, of the uncle that died. That Mordecai think that, ah, I'm just helping this one. So whatever she has in my house, she should be grateful, even if the second class. That challenged me very, very, very deeply. And I wish to share with us what God said to me about the conviction that God brought to my life, my heart uh, personally. In this regard, when the Lord was challenging me, even though then he called it pastoral care, he was looking to me as it's a pastoral, pastoral heart that I must develop. But when I read this of Mordecai, I just felt that if the Lord help us, the gatekeeping of our own homes being the most important and being the most, the, the primary, that each and every man, each and every child that has come into our own hands, in our own homes, will be prepared for heaven, will be prepared for great heights. Even as we saw Mordecai. I think it's very, very crucial and a, an aspect of selflessness that God will want us to check very briefly and pray about. Let me show you very briefly what the Lord for several years back showed me and convicted me about Disciples that will come into my hands, dependents that will stay with me. I say I thought that God was developing a pastoral care in my own heart. But now I know that he's not just talking of a pastoral care. He's talking of a very practical thing that must happen to each and every one of us. If we are going to be gatekeepers and especially gatekeepers of our homes, as I saw the selflessness of Mordecai treating to it first and foremost. I want us to look at second, I think it's second somewhere, and it should be chapter 12. Second somewhere, I think it's chapter 12, where Nathan, Nathan, where Nathan. Uh, came to David. Is this Second Samuel 12? Yes. I'm thinking of the nurturing of Esther in the hands of Mordecai to become, as it were, a daughter. To have a sense of being a daughter. To develop all her potentials. To develop all her beauty. To develop all her talents. And never to be spoiled in the hands of Mordecai. Esther didn't rebel. Because indeed Esther was at home in Mordecai's hands. Let's look at chapter 12. The nursing of a soul as it were to become a daughter. And the Lord sent Nathan, verse 1, unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. Verse 3. But the poor man had nothing, 
save one little ewe lamb which he had brought and nourished up and he grew up together with him and with his children and he did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him a daughter. Praise the Lord. It is verse 3 that I want us to very briefly consider. The nourishing of a soul in our own hands, in our own homes, as gatekeepers in order that they will come forth with all the potentials that God has placed in their own lives. Not our children were taking an, an extreme case of Mordecai. That it was not his direct children. It was not one of the very direct children that Mordecai could form and present very, very beautifully. It was just an uncle's daughter. We are saying this so that God is calling us to be gatekeepers and we must be gatekeepers first and foremost of our own homes. It is a parable that Nathan told David and Nathan said to David that there was a man he was poor. Not all of us will be men or means. But that doesn't mean that we cannot raise the children in our homes, those that have come into our hands. It is the question of selflessness that if all of them see and discover that there is no discrimination, This man is very plain and transparent with me and he is with his children. The love that I'm getting from him is like his own children. There is no discrimination. The way we will handle the people in our own homes as men. Children in our own homes as men. And exemplified, we are saying, especially of those that are not from our lines. It's very natural as it were for a parent to love and expend all that he has on his own children. But when I saw in the life of Mordecai that ah, it was not his direct child, I just felt that it is what we, may, we need to pray about as we are called to be gatekeepers. Now, the chapter three of us of chapter three of um, Numbers twelve was the parable that Nathan was bringing to David. Our direction is not in what happened to David, and Nathan was trying to bring a conviction over his own life. It is just the example he gave of this man. That even though poor, he could purchase an ewe lamb. And the Bible says, he didn't just look at that lamb as a source or make or meat tomorrow. He didn't just was going to use that lamb. He saw potentials in that lamb. And it is way the, the way the man handled the lamb that I say, ah, God showed me that anybody that comes into my hand, any child that comes into my hand, I must not see him less. He may come from a very disadvantaged situation. He may come from a position that you may never grade him to be like your own children as was exemplified by an animal here. It was a lamb. 
But I was so surprised that this man, when he brought up this lamb, the Bible says he did eat of his meat. Are we together? What the man ate, he gave the lamb. He did drink from his own cup. And he carried this lamb and we put, as it were, in his own bosom. And that he was unto him a what? A daughter. I don't have all the time for us to look at that kind of pastoral care that must be brought home, that must be what God will help us as it were to apply right in our homes as we are seeing the, as we are seeing Mordecai. But let me just ask that the children you have in your own home do they receive the, this kind of treatment? Do they experience that kind of love from your own heart? That they become so very, very relaxed and comfortable that, as we are noting, the Bible says, even though a, a, a lamb, that man, he became as his own daughter. I pray that the Lord he will help us. I'm looking at the selflessness of Mordecai. And let me again just look at the fact that it was not just the bringing up of, Mother, of Esther that showed his selflessness. Let's look at also the fact that Mordecai had no tendency of God fatherism. He had no tendency of God fatherism. A term that has become so very common in our national language now, as we consider, as we hear it everywhere in politics. I saw that Nehemiah, uh, sorry, Mordecai, didn't have that tendency at all in his own life. He was so selfless. As men, we are help to different people in different aspect at different categories and different situations but I admire Esther sorry I admire Mordecai that look Esther became a queen even though Esther became a queen and Esther was raised to a very high position but let's note what Mordecai was. What Mordecai still remained. Do you know that even though Esther was a queen, Mordecai remained a gatekeeper? Praise the Lord. Who made Esther, Esther a king, a queen? It was Mordecai, isn't it? He made her a queen. And she is a queen. And I was, I was bothered that Mordecai is content in being a gatekeeper. He's still sitting there at the gate. If you explain what happened to Mordecai, he's praying for Mordecai, sorry, he's praying for Esther, he's making sure that everything goes all right with uh, Esther, but I didn't see Mordecai put in one single word for any personal gains to flow from Esther to him. Mordecai just remained a gatekeeper. For me to think that Mordecai never took advantage of the fact that now or the gate that I raised in my own house is the one who is in charge. 
who is in charge, who could say anything and it will happen, whom if he just point a finger, things can move for me. Is it not possible that Mordecai could have been moved from the position of being at the gate to being placed somewhere else that attracted a higher honor, attracted a higher income, attracted something higher. Mordecai remained a gatekeeper. Even though Esther is the very next person to the king and Esther could manipulate anything actually. Can we think of this kind of quality that God is thinking of us as gatekeepers? As men that he wants to place in authority. I want you to think this. Just apply it. Ask in your own heart. If your own brother, just a brother, becomes something in government, will you not expect that your estate will change immediately? If your, your son becomes something in government, those of us that have campaigned for people and they are now in position, don't we expect that as soon as they are getting there, they should remember me? And it is very, very common as we have noted, as we have seen in our national life, that people that have placed others in position, they are, and if those men do not favor them, they seek for them to be removed, isn't it? You are all very familiar with what happens. But I want you to ask in your own heart. It may, you may never be in a position to place somebody in a very high political position. But even the little, little, little favors you do to people, don't you want to take advantage of it? Don't you look back and say, ah, this man should have remembered me because that I am the one who helped him. To do this, I'm the one who introduced him. I'm the one who who's, was one of his referees. I'm the one who spoke as it were to someone to remember him. I'm the one who trained him. It is the heart of Mordecai that I want us to see today. If we are going to be get God's own gatekeepers as Mordecai was. That he brought, he wrote great things in the land. Number one, the reason was because the Lord who knew him saw in Mordecai that he wouldn't take advantage of anyone. I was going to be looking at the, the case of Ziba. Ziba, there is a man like that Ziba in the Bible, isn't it? Do you remember him? The man that when King David decided to favor the son of Saul who was a cripple. That son of Saul had, I think he had a servant called Ziba, isn't it? And Ziba was the one, sorry, the son of Saul was the one who brought Ziba as it were even to David. But very quietly, Ziba was seeking to double cross that man. And there be many of us. Many of us. I want us to know that if God does not help us. That our lives as it were. Is that we are not. God has dealt with our own lives. Something has died in our own lives. That even though we would have taken advantage, would have seek advantage of others, of men that we have helped. But it is not in us to so think and to so push for and to remain content where God has placed us 
I would want us to, to pray about this. Ziba, when he had one opportunity with David, when David was running, Ziba carried things and went and waited for David. And he gave one terrible report about the, the king's son. He said, look, as you were running, the man sat tight in Jerusalem because he's saying that at last the kingdom will come back to Saul and I will be, I will be the king. The son of Saul didn't, didn't ever say that. But Ziba, by that, collected his fees, collected his estate, collected everything. Are you a man who is here? You say it is God's blessing that you have cheated men. You have cheated this little thing that people have placed in your own hands. The introduction that people have given you in positions, you went and closed it and turned everything to your own self. Are you here today? And the very, 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 very help that people give you, you turned and finished them. We discovered that Mordecai was not like that. Mordecai never, never served for gains. He remained a gatekeeper while Esther was there. I was doing his work very, very faithfully. He never served for gains. Look at what happened. The Bible says one of these days, there were some two people that plotted to kill the king. Because the king must have annoyed them or something. And Mordecai had. Mordecai got to know about it. I'm just thinking of the sensitivity, the spiritual sensitivity of the man who will be a gatekeeper. But the fact that Mordecai did his work without looking forward for promotion, not wanting, as it were, to use it for his own very personal gains. Mordecai just felt that, look, as the king has put me here, like Daniel, he said, I would that the king will suffer no damage. Hence, when he heard that, and look at what, what he did. Couldn't Mordecai have gone with such explosive information in his own hand? He would have told Esther that, in, let me speak to the king. Do you know that Mordecai quietly went and told Esther? Say, go and tell your husband. Go and tell the queen. I don't think as, uh, uh, Mordecai even wanted to identify with that information that he was passing to the, queen, to the king. But we thank God for Esther. As he went, he accredited it to Mordecai and it was written down. Praise the Lord. For us to see that Mordecai was not doing it for promotion. Look at verse chapter 3. He said, and after these things, Aserus promoted Haman. I felt that that is where Mordecai would have become very, very bitter. Who was actually worth for promotion now? Was it not Mordecai? What did Haman do that he was promoted? And if I were Mordecai, I would say, eh, so I saved you. I saved your own very life, the king. And you are promoting another person. Do you know that Hammer? I know I have an I have an, an understanding of why Hammer was promoted. Hammer could buy favors 
whatever Hama wanted to do, Hama would bribe himself in. He would bribe his way through. Is that not true of Hama? You know when he wanted to kill the, the Jews, what did Hama do? He took money and went and gave to the king and said, look, I sponsor this. Take this money and wipe out these people of Mordecai. Hama would bribe himself. I fear that that promotion of Hama was by bribery. And you may be sitting here. Let me tell you that even though Hama was in a position that we can say was at a gate, but did he last? Did he go far? Because he would buy his promotions. Because he would bribe his way into everything. And that has become very characteristic of, of, of us. Even Christian people. Are you going to be a gatekeeper? I wish God will help us. God is speaking of the qualities of God's own gatekeepers. They are not men that bribe themselves into positions, bribe themselves into things, bribe themselves into favors. Men that bribe themselves for contracts. I would want to ask you, are you there? And that's where you have risen, that's how you have risen to where you are. Hama didn't last long. And let me tell you, very soon, as I read this book of Esther, as I just perused through it, it gave me a very, very, very clear conviction again this morning that it shall not be long when evil we pay tribute to righteousness. When evil we bow to righteousness. Don't strengthen your, your, yourself in evil and think that you are going far. I wish that God will help each and every one of us to say, look, I want to be God's own gatekeeper at whatever positions you are. If you begin to develop these qualities that we are looking at in Mordecai, the guests indeed will be turned to that position where you occupy. It shall not be long. Praise the Lord. But I just want us, as our time is fast going, to look very quickly at the second Second quality with which we should be praying together. The second quality I found in Mordecai as we read in chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. I saw that Mordecai refused, is a man who refused the smallest compromise. He would not compromise for anything. Let it be the smallest one. Because as I read from chapter 3, I saw that what was it? What was it that Mordecai could not bow down? Could not bow to Hama and greet him? Even if he's bound to him and abusing him in his heart. That's how we do it to men, isn't it? We don't like them. But because we are to bow down to them and greet them, I wish I told you what one man did to show us how we, 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 we bow to men. It's a story, so 
Don't ask me whether I was there. They say one man went to market with his wife and somebody was beating his wife and he did nothing about it seemingly. Say after the wife asked her, asked him, ah, you see how that man was maltreating me and you didn't do anything. He told the wife that he didn't, she didn't see how she put his own hand in his own pocket and was abusing the man. Didn't she see it? She did, he did something. He put his own hand in his own pocket. Was abusing the man. If, it's, if she looked well, she abused the man very well. How we can, we may, you know, just pretend to be honoring men only as it were to be insulting them in our hearts. Mordecai could do that. He could have done that. He could have said yes. Is it not just to bow? But I saw that Mordecai would not. Why didn't Mordecai do this? Why didn't he compromise to the smallest smallest thing the bible says when the people press and press and press he told them the reason and his reason touched me so much if we are going to be gatekeepers the bible says Mordecai said look at verse chapter 3 and uh, verse, um, where he told them that because he's a Jew. What verse is that? 